Hello, welcome to this special CUBE conversation. I'm John Furrier, host of the CUBE. I'm here in the Boston area studio on the East Coast for a couple of weeks, going to be in New York in about a week and check out the community there and start setting up some CUBE action in New York. Obviously we've got Boston covered as well as in Palo Alto. I got a great guest here, Ed Sim, who's the founder and general partner at Bolt Start VC. Also prolific newsletter writer and commentator on Twitter as well. You got to check him out on Twitter as well. What's hot IT.VC where he, he writes a weekly newsletter and what's hot. What's great about Ed is I've interviewed a lot of his portfolio companies. Uh, he's a great enterprise and tech investor. So it's not just enterprise, but he's one of the, I would say original gangsters on the enterprise side. We've, you know, back when it wasn't as cool as it is now, Ed, Great to see you. I saw your tweet. You highlighted Eileen Lee. She coined the term unicorn. Uh, enterprise is hot. Uh, <laughs> What's hot in IT is your is your blog, Substack, newsletter. Um, hey, we're cool. Enterprise is cool. Welcome to this uh, this podcast cube interview. Oh, hey, John. Thanks for having me. Honored. Uh, I think you mentioned you've been doing this for 13 years. This is year number 28 for me doing early stage enterprise software. So I've seen a few cycles. And uh, just a comment on my uh, a newsletter, what's hot it.vc. Uh, I started that over seven years ago, writing a weekly newsletter just to share my notes. But part of it was to uh, shed a light on how I thought enterprise infrastructure software in particular was quite sexy. I'm talking about dev tooling is sexy, same with cloud infra and security. And guess what? Based on Eileen's data, I think it became a little too sexy right now, which is cool and also frightening. <laughs> It's interesting, it's almost a slingshot. I mean, I'm, I'm old enough to remember when I was in college in the 80s, and uh, late 80s, um, and broke into the industry in the early 90s with Hewlett Packard, IBM, and those days was mainframe to mini and the PCs was our, my generation. And so the internet really kind of came along when I was kind of, you know, getting my, you know, professional groups grounded. And, and it's just been great rides since then. And I think now it's probably the most exciting time in the, uh, in the tech industry because it's kind of that convergence of the big iron days meets democratization of PCs and the internet, kind of all kind of happening around the next gen cloud scale, the role of data and AI is, is certainly highlighting the, the instant use cases of a generational shift in, in how things are produced and consumed. So all things enterprise now is kind of the, the ingredients for essentially founders and innovation and ultimately wealth creation. I mean, I think we're going to see a wealth creation cycle coming uh, never seen before. And again, the role of the clouds are, are there too. In fact, we just talked about on our podcast how the VC market's even changing with the big boys like Facebook, Meta, NVIDIA and Amazon writing checks. Uh, and more in the aggregate than say some of the old school VCs. So, and you got the solo GP trend going on where you know experts write their own checks, they can move fast. Uh, you guys are talking about uh, you know, inception, getting with founders early. I mean, this is a really exciting time. And, and you know, I kind of put out a lot out there, but that's the market. It's kind of crazy, it's changing, and the power dynamics are shifting. And again, it goes to where the value is, right? It's going to be the founders. So, you know, what's your take on all that as you sit back and, and, and you're talking about it weekly, I know, but what's your take on this hot market? What's shifting and what's happening? Yeah, I think about it two ways, right? I think that um, we just went through an era called the ZERP era, which is zero interest rate policy. And I think we got a little ahead of our skis over there because uh, fundings uh, and preemptive funding has kept happening over and over again. And a lot of these companies ended up being overvalued. So I think there's a hangover effect that we're going to work through over the next couple of years where, you know, companies that might've been valued five to $10 billion in the private markets during the ZERP era may only be worth $2 billion or two and a half billion dollars these days. So I think we went through a lot of pain. I think there's more pain to come. On the flip side, because of all the trends that you mentioned, like AI, for example, um, and because that we've gone through the ZERP era, founders now have the religion in terms of, let me forget about everything that I learned over the past few years, and let me go back to basics. Let me build a startup again, back from first principles. And back in the day, you know, back in like 2010, when the cloud was really starting to kick in, you know, there's this mantra about lean startups. It was scale it, uh, it was nail it first and then scale it. <laughs> what ended up happening was, is that the VCs got showered with so much capital that they would just throw money at founders and the founders were scaling it before they're nailing product market fit and nailing the product. So I think that this will be the best class of startups that comes out. When you look at five, seven years from now, you're going to look back at this and be like, oh my God, there are some amazing founders that built some amazing companies that were really efficient and you know, leveraging this AI thing. Um, let me just make a quick comment on AI. I mean, look, we've been around the block long enough where, you know, do we have an internet company anymore? 
do we have a mobile company anymore? Do we have a Java company anymore? Do you remember there used to be like a Java fund, right? So I think AI is just an enabling technology. And in our opinion, um, if you're a founder starting a company or if you have a company, and if you're not thinking about how to leverage AI in your product, whether it's just a feature or maybe it's a new product offering, then I think you're insane because um, the technology with the LLMs out there, the intelligence around it, um, the ability to use an API or even grab an open source model and train it to uh, give you an instant result, uh, I think is, is off the chart. So that cost compression has come down a lot. And most founders I see today are, are starting with some type of um, you know, AI leveraged product. And I want to hesitate to say that, you know, I don't want to say that we're funding AI companies because it's just inherent in everything we do. AI is just in all software. Well, it might help for me if I say, let's get funding, do a little AI wash, get the LPs, put more cash in. But I think you're right. I mean, absolutely. Look, at when I talked to Adam Selesky before reInvent, I had an exclusive sit down with him. I brought that up, that point. I think that's a nuanced point, but I think it's worth cl double clicking on it because, you know, if you look back at the internet and the web in particular, you know, when I was in business school in the 90s at, at Babson at night, you know, it was called the information superhighway at that time. It wasn't even called the internet yet. It was called, or the web wasn't even there. The W3C hasn't even, didn't even move to the US yet. Uh, and what's happened in 90, I think 95, um, Tim Berners-Lee and Tim Reagan, those guys moved over, right? So, so that, that didn't happen. The, there's no inter, there was no internet company. I think AOL and CompuServe called themselves internet, the internet company, but there wasn't, it wasn't even the web yet. So the standards of the World Wide Web was interesting, so that was open. And so, uh, you know, you had CompuServe and the online service providers back in the day. So what's interesting is, is that you got the haves and have nots now on the startups. You got the SaaS guys pivoting to the AI, which is key. key. We're seeing that valuation, you know, some down rounds of the ones who didn't get the fit and scale too fast, they're getting crammed down. And they're pivoting into the AI and the AI native startups are getting great funding. And so you have this AI movement. So I agree with you. It's not just AI, it's the environment. Like the internet, it was closed, online service providers, and then open World Wide Web. Do you see the similarity there? I mean, do you see that thing now? Is, is open AI, I mean, technically it's proprietary. I mean, it's closed. Yep. Uh, I mean, yes, yep. it's closed. We call that a, a you know a online AI supplier. Um, but <laughs> meanwhile, open source is booming, right? So um, you got the ear of the ground on the, v on the VC side with, with devs. Is open going to go the way of the web or is it going to be a mixed match Proprietary, open AI developer. I think it's. I think it's going to be. I think it's going to be more of the latter, right? First of all, I think it's so early and it's hard to predict what the future will look like. But um, if you look at kind of the data, and we talk to lots of CIOs and buyers at large enterprise software shops, and because of the Chat GPT moment, where it became very easy and democratized access to AI to show how powerful it could be, many of these large enterprises kicked off pilots, and a lot of the pilots were just leveraging off of open AI. But I think over time, after you saw the governance issues that ar arose last year, right, when Sam got kicked out and then came back in, um, I think people understand that, wow, to have one company control access and, and an API to all my enterprise applications, I think is a scary place. So I think that really opened up the opportunity for uh, the rise of open source. And I think, you know, you look at uh, models like Llama um, uh, and, and other kind of open source models, whether it's Anthropic and others. And I think we're going to live in a multi-model world um, and where there's going to be some open source and some open AI, depending on kind of what cost issues you may have, what privacy issues you may have. And if you think about it, think about like a 10-step enterprise workflow. And perhaps in that workflow, maybe use open AI because it's very easy to look at some um, you know, more of a public kind of data analysis. And then maybe you have a human in the middle giving it a thumbs up or a thumbs down. And maybe the next step of the workflow goes to um, looking at your own proprietary data where you want to keep it super, super secret. And maybe there's a rag there. Um, you know, uh, People are using that to get a more specific and a smaller model to, to get a more specific answer. So I think we're going to live in a, in a hybrid world. Um, and I think it's super, super exciting because right now I feel like it's just the beginning of the gold rush again, yeah. but yet we have to have our sanity around valuations, right? Yeah. Because I think we lost from collective minds as enterprise software investors. It's enterprise software became very cool. Too much money came in and just blew up the sector in terms of valuations. And right now we're sitting 
you know, at unhealthy numbers across the board with all these unicorns. I think Eileen said there's like 416 unicorns now in the enterprise, which comprises 80% of all unicorns. Once upon a time, there were only 15, that was 10 years ago. So there's a lot of stuff happening right now, but I am, I am super pumped. Um, and I think we're just at the beginning of a massive, massive curve right now. Yeah, I, I like what you're saying there about the the mixing models. And I, I, I talked to Pat Gelsinger one time when he was at uh, VMware running VMware before he went to Intel. And he, he, you know, he and I joked about open and close. He says, the, the Intel proprietary processor was a, a processor was proprietary, but no one cared. No one looked inside the processor, did its job, uh, but everything else was open systems, right? So, and how you configured those those machines. And and again, we, we, we see the same world happening now. Okay, I can use that tool for that, but I'm going to be open from a dev standpoint. Uh, and I think to me, I'm watching, and I, this is where I want to, ask you what you said earlier and double click on that is that velocity of startup formations, okay, and time to value on the product market fit are the, are the key. Now the question uh, that everyone's asking is, what are the entrepreneurs doing? That's the tell sign. Those are the canary in the coal mines for the trends. So like the cloud, which accelerated startup formation, because you didn't have to buy a data center or gear, you just put your credit card down. AI is going to accelerate the founding and acceleration process of that zero stage to first customer. How are you seeing the startups walking through your door now uh, at the formation stage or even pre-formation as you'd call it, um, as they start you know, ideating and getting vis visibility on, on an opportunity and then what's their capture strategy out of the gate? What do you see in that idea, zero stage, jump out there and get value going? Is it shorter cycles? You kind of mentioned that. What's happening in that, in that part of the process? Yeah, so these are all great questions. So at, at Bold Start, I, I've basically coined the term, we call it inception investing. And that's when you uh, engage with founders uh, well before they incorporate, you help them battle test and iterate on their ideas. Um, and then you kind of verbally work with them to come up with a uh, price so you can lead their round kind of, you know, so upon company formation, you know, legal formation, they're ready to hit the gates running super fast. Last year we did eight net new uh, enterprise related investments. Uh, this year, I think we've already done two. So we're running very fast right now. And we're seeing a lot of founders actually come back and think about new ways to reinvent existing uh, markets, right? Think about it. Every, you know, the beautiful thing about enterprise software, it's a gift that keeps on giving. Every 15 years or 20 years, no matter how big a company is, it's it's open for reinvention, right? I'll give you a good example. We had funded a customer uh, in the uh, customer support space and they were going after Zendesk. And they had a unique data model where the customer uh, would be the atomic unit versus the, the ticket or how someone reached out to someone. Well, we ended up exiting that to Meta um, for a reported, you know, it wasn't disclosed, but reported over a billion dollars. And then we just bought that back out with uh, our friends at Redpoint and Battery. Uh, and the whole idea around buying that back out is they're sitting on a pile of data <laughs> and guess what? There's this thing called AI. Yeah, exactly. We are just going to AI the crap out of it, right? So this is an amazing, so this will be one example, which is an unusual one. And then I'm looking at startup founders. I have founders coming out of the gate right now. For example, when you're looking at public companies like HashiCorp, HashiCorp is, is a tremendous open source company, but they had some issues with their licensing. People are complaining about pricing around vaults and things like that. So I think there are opportunities for people to come out and create a new vault competitor or Think about this, let me give you a crazy idea. Uh, we backed some founders and, and I won't say who, but they uh, were looking at kind of the SCM market, you know, GitHub and GitLab. When was the last time we ever in did any innovation around GitHub and GitLab? Yes, of course, there's some AI related uh, um, angle to that, let's, let's just say, and I can't wait to, to share that with you. But this is the example, right? When you take a new technology as groundbreaking as AI, can you actually build it from scratch in a better way than bolting on AI on top of a, an existing infrastructure that may not have been built for that uh, era. You know, that's that's such a great example on a call out. One, you mentioned earlier, disruptive enabler AI. That's a great examples of those, um, of, of one, going after an incumbent and taking down a big market fast. So one little feature, you do it. The other thing that you brought up is interesting, and I noticed this in the, in the social media wave on that last big wave of innovation, is that you had companies had to build their own stuff from scratch. There was no general purpose enterprise software around for their business. Like take Facebook, for instance, they build their own stack from day one. And so do you see similar kind of things happening now where there's the accidental startup. I mean, hell, we're a media company. We're sitting on a ton of video AI. Maybe we're a video company. Maybe we're a data company. Or well, we're certainly a data company. But you see these accidental you know, discoveries that just happen because they built their own stuff for themselves. Um, and I see a lot of that in these early markets like AI where 
you know, look at Rag taking off. You mentioned that earlier. So there's, yeah. this, there's a lot of founders out there. I had to build my own stuff. Hey, that's a company. There's a pony in there somewhere. I know that's actually a good, good venture opportunity. What, you, what, you know, what's your funny? take on that? Yeah, once upon a time, like 15 plus years ago, a lot of the coolest uh, infrastructure companies came out of existing Silicon Valley web scale companies, right? You think about like Confluent came out of LinkedIn. Uh, think about some of the infrastructure companies that came out of Airbnb or, or Uber. Um, and so, yeah, I think the hard part right now when you're looking at AI in the enterprise is kind of that last mile piece, right? It, it's easy to get up and running. It's easy to, to, to you know, uh, call an API and, and get an answer. But the question is, is can you get that answer repeatable, right? You know, can you make it happen every single time? And how do you kind of build around that? How about AI security? Um, I, I have been banging on the drums for a long time about um, there's no AI in the enterprise without AI security. And that is definitely a big risk when you talk to some of the largest uh, organizations. You know, fortunately, we backed uh, a founder who is starting his third company that we've known for a long time named Ian Swanson, and we funded Protect AI uh, in January of 2022 or February of 2022 before AI uh, was really hot and sexy. Right, so so these are things as a, as an investor, like being an inception investor, you have to find founders who can see around corners. And guess what? He was working at AWS, you know, leading go to market for SageMaker and a lot of the AI products. And he heard um, a lot of the Fortune kind of five hundred customers saying, "Hey, you know what? I, I need more visibility on my models from a security perspective. We have it from a operational data perspective." And you know, by the way, our thesis was let's give them three years of runway to see if he can kind of. Um, see if there's a big hack that happens to, or a seminal moment, but we didn't predict GPT. And guess what? After our initial round, they raised like $40 million last year because the market was hot, but we had a product in the market ready to go. So those are the things that that are kind of the things you need to think about and almost think three years ahead of advance to see if, um, you know, make some bets about the future with, with founders who can see around corners. I love chatting with you, one. Uh, you've been on the Cube alumni before and your companies are all enterprise. We've had interviewed most of them. But I got I was joking on Twitter as before you came on. It's getting more enterprisey. We were kind of riffing back and forth on Twitter there. It's going to get more enterprisey before it gets even more consumer, even more I see. Because if you look at the cloud market enabling all this distributed computing paradigm emerging fast, the whole multi-cloud problem what we call super cloud is still a problem. They're still proprietary stacks, if you will. If I'm, they're going to hate that I use that word, but let's just say different code bases running essentially similar services across the cloud. So to me, that would look like the old mainframe days, okay? So you're going to see more standardization around environment, traversing environments at the infrastructure level. And then ultimately the software side, which it will sit on top, has to run in a distributed fashion. So there's going to be more distributed computing stuff going on architecturally, as well as the tsunami of applications right, sitting on top of it. So as you look at your experience, how do you see that playing out? What would you, how would you connect those dots as an investor um, is it lower in the stack? Obviously Silicon Advancements is all the rage right now. NVIDIA is taking all the press on that, but you're seeing a lot of infrastructure to app from super chips to super apps going on um, and everything in between, but it's still hardware, middleware, and software, right? <laughs> it's, it's the same it's, game. You know, it's all the same stuff, right? At the end of the day, I feel like the pendulum swings kind of over time, we had mainframe computing back in the day. Then you had a client server. Then you had the internet, which was which was almost mainframe, and then now you, then you had microservices and containers, which is almost like distributed again, right? So where's the pendulum going? Is cloud actually a centralized kind of computing uh, uh, environment now? Now you're seeing edge stuff, right, John? You're seeing you're seeing stuff around the edge. And by the way, think about this. I think an opportunity over time is that the as the models get uh, smaller um, and get more specific as the uh, chips get more powerful on the edge. I mean, look at the Apple laptop right now, or look at the iPhone. Think about the privacy and data implications, kind of being able to process, and the cost implications, being able to process um, and give you answers on the edge, right? You know, and on these devices without reporting back to the cloud. And then think about all the opportunities like sensors sitting out, um, you know, collecting data on windmills. Think about cars, automobiles. Automobiles are moving data centers right now. I think there's just going to be an explosion of opportunities kind of looking at edge related stuff over time. Um, and not all of it has to be uh, round tripped back to the cloud back and forth when it comes to latency and privacy. So I, I would say that's one thing that's, that, that's going to be interesting kind of moving forward. I think the other, by the way, is that I'm also excited about this environment right now because only the craziest founders are starting companies right now. They're they're reading the news. You know, on the one hand, the public markets are on fire, but it's really driven by the big seven because there's been no tech IPOs, um, you know, over over the last like eighteen months, right? So 
Um, but you got to be crazy founder to really believe in the opportunity that you're building right now. And I liken it to Noah's Ark. When the big flood comes, yeah. no matter how many animals there are, only two of, two of each make it on the boat, yeah. on the ark, right? <laughs> so in the last three years, we had 30 of everything in every single category getting funded and it just created stupid competition and people did stupid things. And now I think there's going to be less competition coming around the pike. So um, you add all that together and there's a massive opportunity ahead of us. Well, here, here on that one, I totally agree. I, in my experience over the past three cycles I've lived through, best startups come out of the down the, the trough and when it's really the most painful because by the time their crazy idea gets gets going, it's almost like they survived and also they were early and they're built out when it hits positive, right? So um, the, the good founders will aren't afraid to go in there and, and handle some of the, the waves that are hitting the boat. So uh, I totally agree. I, I say, if you got an idea, if this capital, and you're seeing valuation strong on the AI side. So it's not like it's there's not a lot of capital left. It's just the appetite to fund unknown is, our, is there. But so I think it's a great time to start up. And I think that I tell, encourage everyone, if they got a durable idea, it's great. Now, the key to success, in my opinion, which is why I love the Cube, is you know connecting with community and, and providing content to help founders. And I think you know what you do, and hopefully this interview will help folks, but you're also on the same religion we are, which is it takes a village and it takes a community to yeah. help founders. And with your inception strategy, getting early, trust, Trusting a capital partner uh, as a as a partner is super important for founders now because they've seen the the bludgeon and the, and the battle that can go through if they don't pick a good partner early and they get experience. So you know the, the smart money, smart founders are going early to to you or trusted parties to not just ID. It's not like they need help ID. They just want a, a wingman or a person to help them, right? Yeah, so yeah. and then it's not just you. It's also your network. And as we have these networks, Ed, explain your concept because I think this is a. It also highlights why the solo GP is working in some cases. Yeah. If you have community presence and you have value and you're trustworthy, it's a perfect opportunity. So explain uh, as we close out here your vision on this because I think it's a state of the art in my opinion. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Well, I guess a couple of things. First of all, uh, people talk about AI trying to automate venture capital, but at the end of the day, I still think uh, relationships matter. So in the past few years during the ZERP era, it was a transaction-driven world where people just got multiple term sheets and didn't spend enough time kind of with their VC partner or with the founder. And I think uh, because of these board issues, like an open AI issue and other board issues you've seen, founders and investors both understand that, you know, these are 10, 10 year relationships that we're in, entering into. Let's make sure we, we know each other. Let's make sure we can operate with each other through the good and the bad. Um, what both start was purpose built to do was partner with founders with ideas. Um, and, you know, we like to tell the founders, Hey, you know what, our job, we can paint this picture and say, look, we love infrastructure. We love dev tools. We love cyber but we don't see the future. I need to trust you to see the future, right? So it's the idea of how do you have someone uh, with the idea of building a flying car, but when you're going in to sell it to an enterprise, how do you make them feel like I'm getting a faster car instead of the flying car right now, even though you have the flying car vision, right? So so I, I think the one thing we do really well, there's common things that we see over and over again uh, and mistakes uh, that founders may make early. And we want to help founders accelerate their path to product market fit and avoid the mistakes that we've seen for 28 years, you know, myself personally and 14 years of the firm. And fortunately, you know, we actually have a number of companies that have been on the cube, you know, like Sneak, which, which was worth over $7 billion, I guess, as the last valuation last year, Big ID, you know, which is a unicorn itself. You've had uh, Nimrod, I think, uh, and Dimitri kind of on, on the cube. So when you see these patterns over and over again, you have the confidence, you can give the founders the confidence. And we have a whole network of people that can come in that understand that zero to one phase. Because you know what happens? It's like a rocket launch. If you every inch that you change is kind of a mile in, in the atmosphere. So the culture you set from day one, who you hire, how you think about hiring, how you build, um, how you think about go to market as you're building your product, all tie in together. And these are the things that we can, you know, coach founders around. But ultimately, they're responsible for for building that uh, that, that magical product, which yeah. which we're relying on them for. Yeah, mutual respect, uh, honesty. Also, you know, it's hard. I tell startups all the time, hey, you know, you can't get a real, I mean, like you can get degrees in entrepreneurship now, I guess you get, I mean, Babson was an entrepreneurial school I went to, yeah. but I mean, it's, doing a startup is hard. I mean, it's hard, and enterprise is hard too. So it's not easy. <laughs> so you can't just throw money at the problem. 
uh, these I'm, days. One of my partners, like you know, like say, startups are. Am I allowed to curse in this at all? Yeah, or no? of course, absolutely. <laughs> startups are fucking hard. Yeah. <laughs> Period. Yeah. I mean, it's gonna. You know, you're gonna get knocked down three times, and you have to get up every single time and and keep moving, right? And by the way, to your point, John, I have this kind of funny saying that that I've kind of learned over the years is that um, a great partner and investor and board member needs to know the three CHs. You need to know when to chill because sometimes you work with a founder and just leave them alone and they're coding away that they don't want to be bothered, right? You don't want to uh, interact with them because they're in their flow. Sometimes you need to know when to challenge founders. And you know when you challenge founders is not when they get their ass kicked. You need to challenge them when things are going so great that they feel like they're invincible because you need to ask them, like, how do you add another zero? What happens if this happens, right? To help them see what 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 could actually happen and then you cheer for them that's the third ch is when they get their ass kicked three times in a row you yeah. peel them off the ground and say dude you can do this keep going right so exactly. that psychology is so important about uh, about startups frankly you got a lot of great examples i loved your example of the green plum on a, on a podcast you did a while back and as another example perseverance having a good partner you know is a great Great thing. Ed, thanks for coming on and sharing with me. And great to have you on theCUBE solo. You were on with your company before. And by the way, we'll do more. I'm going to be in New York. We're going to do a lot more enterprise. The world's getting more enterprisey, which means it's opportunities. And I think, you know, whether it's a white space or a big market, uh, the disruptions here, and I think this disruptive enabler, that is the data, AI, machine learning trend is going to continue to power uh, change and opportunity. So if you're on the right side of the street on this one, you're going to look good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pumped. Well, John, thank you. And thank you for all you do for the community. Uh, our founders love kind of uh, Silicon Angle. Uh, we love uh, the Cube. So thank you for all you do for uh, helping make enterprise sexy because you've been part of this too. It takes a village. I appreciate it. Um, I appreciate that. Cool. We love what we do. Thanks for coming on. Okay, you're watching theCUBE. Of course, I'm here in Boston. We're in Palo Alto, Boston. Soon to have other studios and, and get experts like Ed and, and in the community sharing their knowledge and also more importantly, uh, money and he writes checks. So check out Ed and he's at Bold Start VC. Of course, what's hot is a great newsletter. Again, great network effect going on there. Thanks for watching theCUBE.